Jane Eyre, chapter 29. The recollection of about three days and nights succeeding this very, is very dim in my mind. I can recall some sensations felt in that interval, but few thoughts framed and no actions performed. I knew I was in a small room and in a narrow bed. To that bed I seemed to have grown. I lay on it motionless as a stone, and to have torn, from, torn me from it would have been almost to kill me. I took no note of the lapse of time of the change from morning to noon, from noon to evening. I observed when anyone entered or left the apartment. I could even tell who they were. I could not understand what was said when the speaker stood near to me, but I could not answer, or I could understand. Um, to open my lips or move my limbs was equally impossible. Hannah, the servant, was my most frequent visitor. Her coming disturbed me. I had a feeling that she wished me away, that she did not understand me or my circumstances, which makes sense, and that she was prejudiced against me. Diana and Mary appeared in the chamber once or twice a day. They would whisper sentences of this sort at my bedside. It is very well we took her in. Yes, she would certainly have been found dead at the door in the morning had she been left out all night. I wonder what she has gone through. Strange hardships, I imagine. Poor emaciated, pallid wanderer. Emaciated means like skin and bones, basically. She's not an uneducated person, I should think. By her manner of speaking, her accent was quite pure, and the clothes she took off, though splashed and wet, were little worn and fine. So in England at this time period, you could tell someone's like social class by their accent. She has a peculiar face, fleshless and haggard as it is. I rather like it, and when in good health and animated, I can fancy her physiognomy would be agreeable. Never once in their, di in their dialogues did I hear a syllable of regret at the hospitality they had extended to me, or of suspicion of, or aversion to, myself. I was comforted. Mr. St. John came but once. He looked at me and said my state of lethargy was the result of reaction from excessive and protracted fatigue. He pronounced it needless to send for a doctor. Nature, he was sure, would manage best, left to herself. He said every nerve had been overstrained in some way, and the whole system must sleep torpid a while. There was no disease. He imagined my recovery would be rapid enough when once commenced. These opinions he delivered in few words, in a quiet, low voice, and added after a pause in the tone of a man little accustomed to expansive comment, rather an unusual physiognomy, certainly not indicative of vulgarity or degradation. Far otherwise, responded Diana. To speak truth, St. John or St. John, my heart rather warms to the poor little soul. I wish we may be able to benefit her permanently. Have I told you guys about physiognomy yet? So physiognomy in this time period was considered science, but we now know it to be pseudoscience. Um, it is the basis of many racist things, but the idea behind it is that every face looks like an animal of some sort. And whatever animal your face looks like, you have the characteristics of that animal. And so that's why like, you can show certain pictures and you think that's a good guy, that's a bad guy, etc. Or in certain books, like the good guy has blonde hair and blue eyes, right? And the bad guy has darker features, which are racist um, ideas. But you can still see physiognomy playing a role in movies and TV shows, right? Um, because there are certain characteristics that the protagonists always have. So even though we know physiognomy to be a pseudoscience and to have racist and prejudiced um, consequences, people still use them even today. So it's just something to be aware of. So when they're identifying her physiognomy, they're trying to decide, is she a beggar? Is she you know, a bad person or a good person? So that's what they're judging her on. Um, that is hardly likely, was the reply. You will find she is some young lady who has had a misunderstanding with her friends and has probably injudiciously left them, which means left them when she shouldn't have. We may perhaps succeed in restoring her to them if she is not obstinate, but I trace lines of force in her face which makes me skeptical of her tractability. He stood considering me some minutes, then added, she looks sensible, but not at all handsome, <laughs> which is mean to like say that in her face. She's so ill, St. John. Ill or well, she would always be plain. The grace and harmony of beauty are quite wanting in those features, which means lacking. On the third day, I was better. On the fourth, I could speak, move, rise in bed, and turn. Hannah had brought me some gruel and dry toast, about, as I supposed, the dinner hour. I had eaten with relish. The food was good, void of the feverish flavor which had hitherto poisoned what I had swallowed. When she left, I felt comparatively strong and revived. Ere long, satiety of repose and desire for action stirred me. I wished to rise, but what could I put on? 
only my damp and bemired apparel, in which I had slept on the ground and fallen in the marsh. I felt ashamed to appear before my benefactor so clad. I was spared the humiliation. On a chair by the bedside were all my own things, clean and dry. My black silk frock hung against the wall. The traces of the bog were removed from it. The creases left by the wet smoothed out. It was quite decent. My very shoes and stockings were purified and rendered presentable. There were the means of washing in the room and a comb and brush to smooth my hair. After a weary process and resting every five minutes, I succeeded in dressing myself. My clothes hung loose on me, for I was much wasted, wasted meaning much thinner. But I covered deficiencies with a shawl and once more clean and respectable looking, no speck of the dirt, no trace of the disorder I so hated um, and which seemed to so to degrade me, left. I crept down a stone staircase with the aid of the banisters to a narrow low passage and found my way presently to the kitchen. It was full of the fragrance of new bread and the warmth of a generous fire. Hannah was baking. Prejudices, it is well known, are most difficult to eradicate from the heart whose soil has never been loosened or fertilized by education. They grow firm as weeds among the stone. So that is a metaphor and imagery for a universal truth about people who are prejudiced or dislike certain groups of people and why education is so important in order for people not to begrudge others. Hannah Bitt had been cold and stiff indeed at the first. Latterly, she had begun to relent a little, and when she saw me come in tidy and well-dressed, she even smiled. What, you have got up, she said. You are better then. You may sit down in my chair on the hearthstone, if you will. She pointed to the rocking chair. I took it. She bustled about, examining me every now and then with the corner of her eye. Turning to me, as she took some loaves from the oven, she asked bluntly, Did you ever go a begging before you came here? I was indignant for a moment, but remembering that anger was out of the question and that I had indeed appeared as a beggar to her, I answered quietly, but still without, not without a certain marked firmness. You are mistaken in supposing me a beggar. I am no beggar, any more than yourself or your young ladies. After a pause, she said, I do not understand that. You like no house, nor no brass, I guess. The want of a house or brass, by which I suppose you mean money, does not make a beggar in your sense of the word. Are you book learned? She inquired presently. Yes, very. But you've never been to a boarding school. I was at a boarding school eight years. She opened her eyes wide. Whatever can you not you keep yourself for then? I have kept myself and I trust shall keep myself again. What are you going to do with the, these gooseberries? I inquired as she brought out a basket full of the fruit. Make them into pies. Give them to me and I'll pick them. Nay, I do not want you to do not. But I must do something. Let me have them. She consented, and she even brought me a clean towel to spread over my dress, lest, as she said, I should mucky it. You've not been used to servant's work, I see by your hands, she remarked. Happen you've been a dressmaker? No, you are wrong. And now, never mind what I have been. Don't trouble your head further about me. But tell me the names of the house where we the name of the house where we are. Some call some calls it Marsh End, and some calls it Moore House. And the gentleman who lives here is called Mr. St. John? Nay, he doesn't live here. He's only staying a while. While he's at home, he, um, when he is at home, he is at his own parish at Morton. That village a few miles off? Aye. And what is he? He's a parson. I remember the answer of the old housekeeper at the parsonage when I had asked to see the clergyman. This, then, was his father's residence? Aye. Old Ms. Mr. Rivers lived here, and his father and grandfather, and Gert grandfather, great, afore him. The name, then, of that gentleman is Mr. St. John Rivers? I, St. John is his Kirsten, christened name, which means christened. And his sisters are called Diana and Mary Rivers? Yes. Their father is dead? Dead three weeks sin of a stroke. They have no mother? The mistress has been dead this many a year. Have you lived long with the family? I've lived here 30 year. I nursed them all three. So she was a wet nurse and then just stayed with the family as a servant. So probably closer to the girls and more motherly to them than even their own mom. That proves you have mu you must have been an honest and faithful servant. I will say so much for you, though you've had the incivility to call me a beggar. She again regarded me with a surprised stare. I believe, she said, I was quite mistaken in my thoughts of you, but there is so many cheats going about, you must forgive me. And though, I continued rather severely, you wished to turn me from the door on a night when you should not have shut out a dog. Well, it was hard, but what can a body do? I thought more of the chiller, not of myself, poor things. They like nobody to take care on them but me. I'm like to look sharpish. 
I maintained a grave silence for some minutes. You might not think too hardly of me, she again remarked. But I do think hardly of you, I said, and I'll tell you why. Not so much because you refused to give me shelter or regarded me as an imposter, as because you just now made it a species of reproach that I had no brass and no house. Some of the best people that ever lived have been as destitute as I am, and if you are a Christian, you ought not to consider poverty a crime. So that could be even speaking to the audience, because even now, it's, you can reflect how do you treat like poor people or beggars in the street when you see them. Nor more I ought, said she. Mr. St. John tells me so too, and I see I had war wrong, but I've a clear different notion on you now to what I had. You look a right down decent little crater. That will do. I forgive you now. Shake hands. She put her flowery and horny hand into mine. Another and heartier smile illumined her rough face, and from that moment we were friends. Hannah was evidently fond of talking. While I picked the fruit and she made the paste for the pies, she proceeded to give me sundry details about her deceased master and mistress, and the chiller, as she called the young people. Old Mr. Rivers, she said, was a plain man enough, but a gentleman, and of as ancient a family as could be found. Marsh End had belonged to the Rivers ever since it was a house, and it was, she affirmed, a bound 200 year old for all it looked but a small, humble place, not compared with Mr. Oliver's grand hall down in Morton Vale. But she could remember Bill Oliver's father, journeyman needlemaker, and the rivers were gentry in the old days of the Henrys, as anybody might see by looking in the, into the registers in Morton Church Vestry. Still, she allowed, the old master was like the other folk, not much out of the common way, stark mad at shooting and farming and sitch like, the mistress was different. She was a great reader and studied a deal, and the barons had taken after her. There was nothing like them in these parts, nor ever had been. They liked learning, all three, almost from the time they could speak, and they had always been of a making of their own. Mr. St. John, when he grew up, would go to college and become a parson, and the girls, as soon as they left school, would seek places as governesses, for they had told their father um, for they had told her their father had some years ago lost a great deal of money by a man he trusted turning bankrupt. And as he was not now not rich enough to give them fortunes, they must provide for themselves. They had lived very little at home for a long while, and were only come now to stay a few weeks on account of their father's death. But they did so like Marsh End and Morton, and all these moors and hills about. They had been in London, and many other grand towns, but they always said there was no place like home, and then there were and then they were so agreeable with each other, never fell out nor threat. She did not know where there was such a family for being united. <laughs> Having finished my task of gooseberry picking, I asked where the two ladies and their brother were now. Gone over to Morton for a walk, but they would be back in half an hour to tea. They returned within the time Hannah had allotted them. They entered by the kitchen door. Mr. St. John, when he saw me, merely bowed and passed through. The two ladies stopped. Mary, in a few kind words, kindly and calmly expressed the pleasure she had in seeing me well enough to be able to come down. Diana took my hand. She shook her head at me. You should have waited for my leave to descend, she said. You still look very pale and so thin. Poor child, poor girl. Diana ha had a voice toned to my ear like the cooing of a dove. She, <coughs> she possessed eyes whose gaze I delighted to encounter. Her whole face seemed to me full of charm. <coughs> Mary's countenance was equally intelligent, her features equally pretty, and her expression, but her expression was more reserved, and her manners, though gentle, more distant. Diana looked and spoke with a certain authority. She had a will, evidently. It was my nature to feel pleasure in yielding to an authority supported like hers, and to bend, or my conscience and self-respect permitted, to an active will. And what business have you here, she continued. It is not your place. Mary and I sit in the kitchen sometimes, because at home we like to be free, even to license, but you are a visitor and must go into the parlor. I am very well here. Not at all, with Hannah bustling about and covering you with flour. Besides, the fire is too hot for you, interposed Mary. To be sure, added her sister, come, you must be obedient. And still holding my hand, she made me rise and led me into the inner room. Sit there, she said, placing me on the sofa, while we take our things off and get the tea ready. It is another privilege we exercise in our little moorland home to prepare our own meals when we are so inclined, or when Hannah is baking, brewing, washing, or ironing. She closed the door, leaving me solace with Mr. St. John, who sat opposite, a book or newspaper in his hand. I examined first the parlor and then its occupant. 
The parlor was rather a small room, very plainly furnished, yet comfortable, because neat and clean. The old-fashioned chairs were very bright, and the walnut wood table was like a looking glass. A few strange, antique portraits of the men and women of other days decorated the stained walls. A cupboard with glass doors contained some books and an ancient set of china. There was no superfluous ornament in the room, not one modern piece of furniture save a brace of work boxes and a lady's desk in rosewood, which stood on a side table. Everything, including the carpet and curtains, looked at once well-worn and well-saved. Mr. St. John, sitting as still as one of the dusty um, pictures on the walls, keeping his eyes fixed on the page he perused and his lips mutely sealed, was easy enough to examine. Had he been a statue instead of a man, he could not have been easier. He was young, perhaps from 28 to 30, tall, slender, his face riveted the eye. It was like a Greek face, very pure in outline, quite a straight classic nose, quite an Athenian mouth and chin. It is seldom indeed an English face comes so near the antique models as, his, as did his. He might well have been a, be a little shocked at the irregularity of my lineaments, his own being so harmonious. His eyes were large and blue with brown lashes. His high forehead, colorless as ivory, was partially streaked over by careless locks of fair hair. This is a, gent a gentle delineation, is it not, reader? Yet he whom it describes scarcely impressed one with the idea of a gentle, a yielding, an impressible, or even a placid nature. Quiescent as he, he now sat, there was something about his nostril, his mouth, his brow, which, to my perceptions, indicated elements within either restless, restless or hard or eager. He did not speak to me one word, nor even direct to me one glance, till his sisters returned. Diana, as she passed in and out in the course of preparing tea, brought me a little cake baked on top of the oven. Eat that now, she said. You must be hungry. Hannah says you have had nothing but some gruel since breakfast. I did not refuse it, for my appetite was awakened and keen. Mr. Rivers now closed his book, approached the table, and as he took a seat, fixed his blue pictorial-looking eyes full on me. There was an unceremonious directness, a searching, decided steadfastness in his gaze now, which told that intention and not diffidence had hitherto kept it averted from the stranger. You are very hungry, he said. I am, sir. It is my way, it, is, it always was my way by in instinct, ever to meet the brief with brevity, the direct with plainness. It is well for you that a, a low fever has forced you to abstain for the last three days. There would have been danger in yielding to the cravings of your appetite at first. Now you may eat, though still not immoderately. I trust I shall not eat long at your expense, sir, was my very clumsily contrived, unpolished answer. No, he said coolly. When you have indicated to us the residence of your friends, we can write to them, and you may be restored to home. That, I must plainly tell you, is out of my power to do, being absolutely without home and friends. The three looked at me, but not distrustfully. I felt there was no suspicion in their glances. There was more of curiosity. I speak particularly of the ladies. St. John's eyes, though clear enough to a literal sense, and a figurative one were difficult to fathom. He seemed to use them rather as instruments to search other people's thoughts than as agents to reveal his own. The which combination of keenness and reserve was considerably more calculated to embarrass than to encourage. Do you mean to say, he asked, that you are completely isolated from every connection? I do. Not a tie links me to any living thing. Not a claim do I possess to admittance under any roof in England. Most singular position at your age. Harry saw his glance directed to my hands, which were folded on the table before me. I wondered what he sought there. His words soon explained the quest. You've never been married? You are a spinster? Diana laughed. Why, she can't be above 17 or 18 years old, St. John, she said. I'm near 19, but I'm not married, no. I felt a burning glow mount my face, for bitter and agitating recollections were awakened by the allusion to marriage. They all saw the embarrassment and the emotion. Diana and Mary relieved me by turning their eyes elsewhere than to my crimson visage. But the colder and sterner their and sterner brother continued to gaze, till the trouble he had excited forced out tears as well as color. Where did you last reside, he now asked. You are too inquisitive, St. John, murmured Mary in a low voice. But he leaned over the table and required an answer by a second firm and piercing look. The name of the place where and of the person with whom I lived is my secret, I replied concisely. Which, if you like, you have, in my opinion, a right to keep both from St. John and from every other questioner, remarked Diana. Yet if I know nothing about your history, I cannot help you, he said. And you need help, do you not? 
I need it, and I seek it so far, sir, that some true philanthropist will put me in the way of getting work which I can do, and the, remun and the remuneration for which will keep me, if but in the barest ne necessaries of life. I know not whether I am a true philanthropist, yet I am willing to do aid to the utmost of my power in, the purpose, in a purpose so honest. First, then, tell me what you have been accustomed to do and what you can do. I had now swallowed my tea. I was mightily refreshed by the beverage, as much as so a giant with wine. It gave new tone to my unstrung nerves and enabled me to address this penetrating young judge steadily.